Okay. Uh, very good morning to you all. Uh, to those that are, I see, uh, looks like I'm alone here at the moment. Just, just me. Still, it's still just me right now. So. Okay. Hey, good morning to you all. Um, uh, happy Sabbath to you all, and uh, thank the Lord that uh, we've made it this morning for our class, which is uh, uh, looking at the at present truth in the book of Deuteronomy. And uh, today we are on lesson number four, uh, which is talking about what. Who knows what lesson number four is talking about? Loving the Lord your God. Yes, to love the Lord your God. Uh, so we want to thank the Lord for this opportunity. And before we begin, let us bow our heads as we pray. Our kind and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege that is ours today to learn and study of your word, which is uh, like refreshing waters that can nourish and quench our thirst in such a dry world. We ask, Lord, this morning, now that as we begin, that your spirit may be present. If he is present, Lord, he will help to teach and to guide and to open our minds, to lead us to all truth and understanding. We ask, Heavenly Father, that you be with those that are attending, be it virtually or uh, in, pres in person. And I also like to pray, especially for those that are still making their way uh, to church, I pray, Father, that you protect them and guide them safely. This is my humble prayer in Jesus' name, with that first and Calvary. Amen. Um, as, as mentioned earlier, uh, we are indeed looking at um, loving the Lord your God. And we are learning uh, from the book of Deuteronomy. In fact, uh, to begin, our memory text is... Uh, uh, from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6, verse 5. So if you have your Bibles with me, or if you have your Bibles with you, sorry, uh, I'd like to ask you please to uh, open to Deuteronomy, chapter 6, verse 5, and please read for us. Uh, it could be in person here or virtually, uh, if there are any people. Yes, 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 yes. Allow the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Love him with all your strength. Mm. Love the Lord your God. You shall, in fact, it says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Um, the, the, the introduction to this week's lesson uh, from the writer of this uh, study uh, draws our mind to uh, an important uh, prayer that is practiced uh, by, by Jews in recognition of, of who God is. Um, so this prayer is, uh, is one of the most, in fact, one of the most important prayers and one of the most repeated prayers. Uh, and it is known as the Shema. Um, this Shema, comes from the word or the root word shama, which means to listen or to obey. So this is a prayer of obedience or a prayer of drawing the mind and, the, and, and all the faculties of a person to say, listen, you know, listen. So if there may be anything that's happening around you, uh, when you approach the time of prayer, you begin with the Shema, and the Shema is, is to bring back your, your mind, bring your mind to, to, the, to where you are. And so the Shema um, says, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Elunehu, Eluhenu, Adonai Echad. That's 
the Hebrew or Aramaic a Hebrew uh, saying it's Shema Yisrael Adonai Elohenu Adonai Echad, which being translated means hear O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. So this Shema prayer is very important because it emphasizes the monotheistic um, um, aspect to God. The, 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 by monotheistic, I, I hope I, I'm not losing a lot of people. It's not a common word. Okay. <laughs> okay, monotheistic, monotheism is the opposite of polytheism. Polytheism is the belief that there are many gods. Um, they may be in agreement, they may, be, they may not be in agreement, it doesn't matter, but there are many. And one form of polytheism, or an example of polytheism, is uh, Roman theology. So Roman theology, in fact, let me not use Roman theology, let me use Greek theology, because Greek theology is, is common. And if you know Greek theology, you will know that there are many gods. There's Zeus, there's Hades, there's Apollos, there's all these many, many, many gods, right? If you go to, uh, should, is it uh, Hinduism? Hinduism has Vishnu, Krishna, uh, you know, all these gods, which belong to one religion. But when it comes to Christianity, when it comes to our belief, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is how many? One. So having three persons in the office of God does not mean that we have three gods. We have one God. So when you approach one of the three, they will simply tell you the same thing that you, you will hear from any one of the three. They don't contradict. They don't, you know, it's, it's like this. I, I don't know if I can use this as an example, but, I, but ideally this is what homes are supposed to be like. Homes are supposed to be like a miniature Godhead, yes. where the father and the mother are one. That's what the Bible says, when the two come together, they become one. In other words, when the kids run to the dead, they must hear the same gospel as the one that they hear from the mom. You know, but sometimes you find in homes, maybe that's not the case, but so monotheism. So this is what this uh, introduction is, is bringing our minds to. So in, in, in us, or in light of loving our God, we need to understand that when, when we come to God, like the Shema, we need to bring ourselves. We, we, we need to come all of us. <laughs> I don't know if, I, if I'm making this clear. So it's saying, it's saying, um, Shema, listen. It's saying, listen, wake up. Come with all of yourself. And then the memory text is saying, you shall love your God with how much? With all your heart and with all your soul. And with what? All your strength. And we are going to go into a bit of depth now as we move on with the study to understand what does that mean to say, you shall love the Lord your God with all this, all that, and all that. Okay? So I don't know if there's any questions now as we begin or any contributions, as I can see that there's, there are some people joining in um, virtually. We'd like to thank God for, for your time and for you joining us. So if you, are, if you have any questions or contributions, uh, yes, my leader. And thank you. I think mine is not really the focus of the lesson, but just the Shama, um, particularly the last part of it. Where it says the Lord, your God is one. That is recently becoming a, a contentious issue uh, when it comes to the teaching of the Godhead and Trinity. Um, with, with some even going to an extent of leaving the church. Uh, under the false impression that the church teaches three gods. Mm. So there is still a lot of work to do in, in, in reteaching 
repeatedly the Godhead. Um, so, so I just wanted to, to point that out that um, that last part of the, the Lord your God is one, yes, you know, has become a, a it's contentious, a, yeah. yeah, a contentious issue that has created a distinction, a rift, yes, you know, yeah. to say, you know what, you guys believe in three gods, um, um, because if you remember. We, we teach uh, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, they are one, but they are distinct personalities, which may create the impression that these three gods, yes. you know, so, so there's that thing, you know, of course, we, 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 we know the lessons, we know the teaching, uh, but there is a need to re-emphasize, even for many of us who've been in the church for a long time, you know, some of these things, need, we need some revision. On them because it's a it's a it's a, it's a very key important uh, teaching. Yes. Yeah, thanks. No, no, no. Thank you very much for that. Um, in fact, uh, if you look at it, you know, I, 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 I'm I'm not well schooled on on this uh, debate that is going on, but you know, part of it you would like to think that it comes from semantics. Uh, you know, in, in the sense that the words people choose to 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 ascribe, for example, saying God the God the God the it would sound wrong because they are not God the God the God the they are the Father Son and Holy Spirit and those three are God so it's not God the God the God the it's the Father the Son the Holy Spirit and those three are God however you find that people choose to use the word Trinity and the word Trinity is not biblical in origin in fact it's not even adventist <laughs> the the trinity theology starts from roman theology where god is one but in three dimensions so he is one being it's a one being that can have can can separate himself to become three dimensions it can be seen as the father it can be seen as the son and yet that's not theology it's not biblically correct because the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit at one time existed separately and were seen. At the baptism of Christ, for example, the Father spoke, the Holy Spirit came down, and Christ was in the water. So clearly, that's not true to say that is one being. You understand? So the, the, I think maybe the, 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 the language maybe sometimes is, is, is the problem. Yes. Sometimes it's not even, maybe you, you mean the same thing, you know? But then maybe because you are using the wrong language, or maybe you know you don't speak the same language, you you start to drift drift apart. And then maybe in that semantic issue, people start to plant, I don't know, whatever it is, yeah. So but Elder, you wanted to you had your hand up. Yeah, I wanted also to say something on the on the same words. Because uh, there is an issue of the Jewish ways as it is translated already in English. The listen, people of Israel. Yes. The Lord is one. The Lord is our God, and the Lord is He's one. Yes. When they were saying this, they were saying they were closing their eyes. It was like a prayer, so that it should be distracted from everything else. God, it, this was an emphasis. I just want to add one more thing to add in my head. I say we need to know as a Christians. We need to know that we are God, 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 God. Yes. Do we really go by this God and God this God alone? Do we have other gods? We are Christians of today. Yes. Are we only serving this God? There are so many things that are happening out there. Do we really understand? That's why, as they were saying these words, they were closing their eyes to, to make sure that people should understand as they are listening these words, they should not be distracted. By anything else that you know, they should understand clear that there is only one God. This message, message, message is coming to us today. So minus. Thank you very much. Thank you, my leader. As we proceed, uh, we are now going into looking at the love, uh, to love God. Um, and uh, we're now particularly focusing on verse, verse one of chapter six uh, to about verse five of chapter six of, uh, in the book of Deuteronomy. And if you remember, uh, Moses was recounting to the children of Israel uh, the history or their history as far as the dealing or the, their dealings with God. And he was showing them 
what God or who God was to them uh, historically as a people. Um, and I, I, in the morning with my elder, we're talking about being reminded, you know, us, us being people that need to be reminded, you know. And yes, you know, we forget, you know, uh, what God has done for us. Um, one writer says, you know, we have, we have nothing to fear of the future, except as we forget how God has dealt with us when in the past, you know. So, um, so this is what Moses is doing. He is re-educating them and reintroducing God to them and saying, this is your father. This is the, the father of this nation, right? So now as we begin, uh, let us look at, we, we want to look at the love of God. So I, I'd like to ask someone if you could quickly please go open uh, to Deuteronomy chapter six uh, from verse one. Deuteronomy chapter six, verse one. All right, I'm reading. Now these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you, that ye might do them in the land whither ye go to possess it. Yes. That thou mightest fear the Lord mm -hmm. thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I command thee, thou and thy son and thy son's son, all the days of thy life, and that thy days may be prolonged. Right. Hear therefore, O Israel, and, right. yes. and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, and that he may increase mightily, as the Lord of thy fathers hath promised thee in the land that floweth with milk and honey. Verse 4. You can hold on to verse 4. Can you see what, what Moses is doing here? He is, he is saying, you know what, we are here. Eh? We, we were, you were told of, of the promised land. You were rescued from the, from the fiery furnace of Egypt. Now you are here. Why are you here, right? And, and he's saying all these things, but he's coming from the past. You know, it sort of suggests to me that before God requires your worship, you know, he, he, he says, look at your past. <laughs> Look, look, look behind you, you know. I, I, I'm not going to require anything from you before, unless you are convinced in the past, yes. you know, that I did it. You know, I'm, I, 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 I am your, I'm your father, you understand? Which is something that's very important, you know, because it, it comes to the love thing. Worship is not going to be genuine unless it's from love. And, and if love is not based on on, on real connection to God, you know, it, 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 it must not be, especially when it comes to this issue, it must not be second or third party kind of relationship where you say, I'm in church because God uh, uh, gave, uh, gave my mother money or, uh, or he did this for my sister. No, no, no. It has to be you. You have to be able to say, uh, you know, I'm sitting here because God did this for me, you know. He's, he's come through for me in this way. You understand? I practically can say I love God because he's like this to me. You understand? It must not be, uh, uh, you know, a hearsay kind of relationship. God is not looking for that. He's saying, look at your past. If you find nothing, walk out. That's, that's the kind of arrogance God has, <laughs> if I may put it like that. He's saying, look, if you find nothing, nothing in your life, if you find absolutely zero in your life that says, I did, I came through for you, walk out. In the case of the Egyptians, he's saying, go back to Egypt <laughs> and eat the garlic and the leeks and all that stuff that you are crying for in Egypt, right? And say, you know, you remember at the, at the sea, they said, you know, it, it was better in Egypt. <laughs> we used to eat this, 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 and that, 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 you know, you understand? Anyways, moving on, uh, let's go now to, to my favorite verse, verse 4. Let's hear what verse 4 is saying now. Okay, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Is how many? One. one. Verse 5. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all, all thy soul, soul and with all thy strength. strength. You see now. 
So God doesn't show up and say, love me <laughs> from nowhere. It doesn't happen like that. In fact, we're going to learn as we go on further that it's God who starts the love thing. Question, who saw who first uh, in the story of the prodigal son? When the son was returning home, who saw who first? If you remember. The father saw the son yes, father. yes. The Bible says it's the father who, who saw the son because the father never stopped looking at that road. You know why the father never stopped looking at that, at that road? It's because the father was so sure. He was so sure that the kind of love I have in this house, my son will never find it anywhere else out there. He's going to come back. So he knew, he knew, God knows that his love can save. He, he, he is absolutely sure. If you've not felt God's love anywhere in your life, then God is saying, come to me and complain. <laughs> you have a right. Because God is so sure that if you're going to be sitting where you are now or listening to me where you are right now, it's because at some point you interacted with God's love. You don't start to love God before he loves you first. So now when he says, hear O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Love him. He's saying, I've already shown you what to do. I demonstrate first and then you copy me. You understand? So now he's saying, just do what I've already shown you. I've demonstrated. It's like, it's like what they say in, in military language. I, I, I didn't know this up to, up to until recently that, you know, these guys will say to you, you know, you know how hard and tough these military leaders can be sometimes. They can say, uh, you, you spoke out of turn. So because of that, get down and give me 100 push-ups. You know, the, the, the code in military uh, uh, ethics is you're not supposed to demand from a, from a lower rank what you cannot do. So when, when they say to you, uh, do this, they're simply telling you, I also can do it. And it will be a greater punishment if he has to demonstrate it for you. <laughs> you know, because there are some people who say, ah, you, you are busy asking things that you can't do yourself. And then you say, okay, fine. Let me get down and give you 100. But when I come up, you are going to give me 200. <laughs> you understand? So this is what God is doing. He's saying, I don't require from you what I am not prepared to do. What I am not demonstrating. What I am not showing. I can't require love from you when I have not shown you love. So if you have not been loved by God, if you have not seen or heard or felt the love of God, he's saying it's fine. Don't worry about it. So quickly, I just want to break down the, 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 the loving God part with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, right? So with all your heart means with your thoughts, your feelings, your ideas, and your inclinations. Love God with your inclinations, with your thoughts, with your feelings, with your heart, your mind, right? So it means that the love of God doesn't just engage um, you on an external level, but it engages you on a deep and an and, and inner level. It engages you at a, at, a, at a deep level. It engages your thoughts. So when you are sitting there, no one is marking you. No one is seeing what you are thinking. You are your own coach. And you say, wait, what I'm thinking right now, does it demonstrate that I love God? <laughs> you understand? No one is marking you. No one is listening to your thoughts. No one knows what you're thinking. But you are your own ref, you know? You blow the whistle for yourself and say, ah, yeah, this one, ah, this is not loving God. You understand? And with your feelings, with your inclinations, what, what are you inclined to do? We know that as a man or as human beings, we're inclined to do evil, right? Yes. Correct? Yes. Yeah. So what does it mean to love God with your inclinations? It suggests to me that you need to be deliberate. There is, it's one thing to, be, to, be pro, to have proclivities towards evil, and it's another thing to want to do evil. Yeah. You understand? We all have proclivities towards evil, but we choose to 
love God. So we actually purpose <laughs> to say, right now, if I sit here, if I continue to sit here, I might be tempted. Let me stand up and leave this place. <laughs> you understand? Yeah. That's, that's being clever. A foolish person will sit there and say, ah, we'll see what will happen. <laughs> I'm strong. <laughs> that's a lie. There's no one who is strong like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, I used to say, hey, yeah. Oh. Uh, I won't say no uh, too many times. Yeah. Mm. Exactly. It's in the book of, uh, yesterday I was reading the book of, is it uh, Proverbs? I, I'll look for the chapter while, maybe before the lesson. It talks about a, a foolish, it says, My son, say to wisdom, you are my sister. You remember that chapter? And you are my, you are my friend. Say, say, embrace wisdom. And then he says, let me show you what a foolish son does. A foolish son knows that at the corner there, there's a harlot that lives there. And she has the attire of a harlot. It's chapter one. I'll, I'll, I'll try and remember what the chapter is. And then he says, but he walks down that road in the, tw in the twilight, you know, in the night. <laughs> and then he hears her. And, she, and he says, she buys linen from Egypt. <laughs> Fine linen. <laughs> She's dressed to the tea, you know. She has all the things that can attract you and draw you. And he walks down that road, expecting something different to, to happen. He says, that's, that's foolishness, you understand? He's in, and then he says, see him as he now falls into the lap of that, of that harlot, you see? So he says, uh, it's the same thing as, 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 as I'm putting across now, that you need to be deliberate. And with all your soul means with everything that encompasses your living. Because the soul, the Bible says in Genesis chapter uh, 2, verse 7, and men became a living what? So. so. If you read the Bible, you will never see the Bible referring to a soul as dead. When the Bible uses the word soul, it refers to living beings only. That's why the Bible says in the book of Genesis chapter 5, every soul that sinneth shall die. You, you understand? Suggesting it's alive. You understand? So the Bible doesn't talk about dead people as souls. So when the Bible says, love the, God, love the Lord the God, your God with all your soul, it is suggesting that do everything you can before you die. And with all your soul suggests, by the way, the soul is not, is not an external figment of the human being. No, no, no. It's not something that the Bible says, and men became you become a soul. In other words, you sitting there or you listening to me are a soul. And so when the Bible says, love the God, Lord, the Lord your God with all your soul, it means with, with who you are. If, if, if you can talk, talk like I do, I talk. <laughs> so I'm loving the Lord with, by talking, you understand? If, 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 <laughs> if you sing, sing, you understand? If you limp, limp for the glory of what? Of the Lord. If you, if you can make hair, make hair for them, for, for God's glory. Do whatever you can do with your soul for whose glory? For God's glory. And then lastly, with all your strength. With all your strength suggests might, influence, possessions, right? There are some people who are more influential than others. You understand? Use that influence for whose glory? For God. There are some people who, are, who have more possessions than others, right? Use what? Those what? Possessions for whose glory? For God's glory. And now quickly, I just want to combine uh, to love the Lord or to love God with to fear God. Mm. To fear God and time is really moving. So I'm just gonna quickly move through and then I'll try and accommodate comments and questions as we come to the, to the end of the lesson. So to fear God, uh, I just want someone to quickly please open Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 12. If you can quickly get there. Um, if I get there before you, I will just read. Ten verse twelve. 
If you are there, please read. 12. Yes. Uh, verse 12. And now, Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee? Yes. But to fear the Lord thy God. Yes. To walk in all his ways. Yes. And to love him and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul. With all thy soul. I, I, I feel like I should ask this question. Maybe time is moving, but I just want to ask. What, is, what does it mean to fear God? God is, a, is a, as we have seen um, before, is powerful. Mm -hmm. And when he hears what he can take, he can do it, he can act. We have seen when uh, the Israelites were taken into captivity. So when when he has he has got anger, he can react. Okay. We have to fear him. He can do things which we maybe as you are lucky to have to say, ah, God, but he can do something. Okay. That's the fear, the fear part. Okay. But now we have to love him because he loved us first. Okay. The fear should come just the fact that he loves us does not uh, make us feel at ease to say how he loves us and then we should be doing our own bad ways. We have to know that time will come where we will plant the world and all the same. Okay. Um, it's about, can I give someone? Yeah. Uh, no, um, I agree with him, right? Uh -huh. uh, brother, brother. Mm -hmm. But uh, I also want to say that I think the fear of the Lord also is uh, I think if you read to say the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all this, right? So the fear of the Lord for me, I think, is obedience. Like um, that's the fear of the Lord for me. And then obviously the other part of us fear the Lord because of what he did. And the fish no one has ever tasted that way. Okay. Now, so um, yeah, that's what I understand. Okay. <laughs> uh, yes, no, I just wanted to. To disagree slightly um, with my fellow student here in the class okay. um, about the fear of the Lord. Um, yes, of course, it's an all powerful God, but would He be worth loving if the love is motivated by the fact that we are scared of Him? Is it still love then? Because then it is forced. If it is motivated by the fact that he can do something terrible to me if I disobey him, mm. then it's no longer love. Yeah, it becomes contentious. Uh, yeah. So, so uh, someone was explaining this. I'm just going to try and see if I can paraphrase it correctly. That um, this fear. Um, maybe let's put God aside for a bit and just compare it to someone you love, like a person you can relate to. And the idea of betraying that person and disappointing them scares you. You're not scared of them. You are scared of the, 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 the destruction you will cause to this relationship. If you do not love them, they may they want to be loved. So out of that state of being cautious and, 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 and fearful, um, you then love. Yes. Um, I don't know if it makes sense. In fact, you know what, Elder, that, that's, that's, okay. You know what, uh, to this question, you will probably uh, have, it's one of those questions where even me, I'm still trying to find a, a, a better answer. But certainly, uh, logically speaking, we cannot fear God for punishment's sake. Because if our, if our service to God is, 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 is persuaded or is motivated by punishment, then God is a tyrant. And we sustain the argument that Lucifer has against God, which is to say that God is a is a tyrant. Rather, what God requires from us is willful obedience and service. And it is produced by love. However, to fear God, to fear God is most likely close to what Elder was saying. To say, 
actually I like what uh, one of the 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 the, the, the attendees here on Zoom says. It's Miller actually. It's Miller says to fear God means to have and entertain the acute sense of His presence everywhere, mm -hmm. in every moment. God also is present in the office, in the kitchen, in the bedroom, and in the marketplace. To suggest that God is in your life and dictates every single, all your soul. Love the God, love the Lord your God with how much? With all your soul. In other words, God dictates everything about your life. You understand? That, what, that, that is what a person who fears the Lord does. A person who fears the Lord is akin to a person like uh, uh, described by this is um, uh, should be Christian service or Christ object lessons, which talks about will. And it says, men, mankind and God have will, have will, both have wills, right? Human beings have their will, God has their will, right? Has, has his will, sorry, right? But when the will of a man submits itself under the will of God, it becomes that will, that man's will becomes omnipotent. What does that mean? It means that that man can stand on a mountain and say to people, if I'm the prophet of the Lord, let fire rain from heaven and fire will immediately obey and do what that man has said. Because that man and God are so like this. They are so in sync. So everything about that person's life, and prophets usually are a good example because prophets do not just minister with their words. When you become a prophet, everything about your life is not, belongs to God. To the extent that God can tell you, go and marry that harlot. And when she runs away, you go back again and pick her from the brothel and bring her back home and marry her again. And she runs again and you continue, you know, you understand? Do you understand that? So to fear God is not fear of punishment, but it is recognition of how much influence God has on my life. To say, look guys, I, I, you know, there are some people like, let me give you an example of people who don't fear God. And sometimes I'm one of those people. I, 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 won't, I won't lie. Walking out without prayer. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Just waking up and walking out <laughs> like you own your life. You know? They're like, you're like, ah, I'm my own protection. <laughs> you know? I'm going to, this day is going to be fine because of me. No, 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 no. You, you don't have that kind of power. You understand? But when you fear the Lord, you recognize that this morning is made possible, you know, like a commercial. <laughs> this morning is made possible by divine what? Mercy. So that's what fearing God is. And that's what it, it, it translates to. And also the love aspect. Thank you very much for that contribution. So to fear God, I just want to quickly go to the benefits of fearing God and then we move on. Time is really moving. Yo. So benefits of fearing God, number one is, um, God will not, uh, you will not depart from the Lord. So if you fear the Lord, you, th there's no departing from the Lord. You will never, in your life, you will never know how it feels to be away from God. Like that, that son, you know, who went away from his father. And if you, if you want an example or reference, just look at Christ on the cross and you will see what it feels like to be away from God for a bit. It's painful. Second thing is the fear of the Lord, like Tabani said, it brings wisdom. A benefit of the fear of the Lord is wisdom. You may not have all the accolades or education that people think provide wisdom, but simply fearing the Lord puts you on a pedestal. The Bible says um, the man that fears the Lord will stand before kings. A simple man can stand before what? Before kings. Because of fearing the, the Lord. Uh, another benefit of fearing the Lord is you will walk in God's what? Ways. Guys, walking in God's ways. Who doesn't want to experience fire raining from heaven? Who doesn't want to experience seeing a, 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 a storm tossed 
you know, sheep come to a calm just because you mentioned it. And Christ says these things. He says, these things I'm doing, you can do greater. But if you walk in his, in his ways, when you stand before a person that is ill and says, rise up, take your bed and walk. And it doesn't, you know, you, we don't do that thing where you say, but your will, Lord, what are. <laughs> It happens immediately because you don't, you know, when your will and the will of God are in sync, you don't have to do that prayer that we do us where we know that our will and God's will. <laughs> They're like, so we say, ah, God, we are praying that, but disclaimer, ah, your will be done. You understand? No, no, no. It's God's will that that person should be, should be, should be healthy. You understand? It's God's will. <laughs> but yours is, you understand? So you walk in God's ways when you fear the Lord. And number four, God takes pleasure in those that I, I have scripture. I'll probably give you scripture if you like later. God takes pleasure in those that fear him. He, he delights. And you know what God does to the people he delights in? Do you know what God does? God uses you as examples. In the case of Job, he said, have you, have you, have you considered my servant? You know? And sometimes God's pleasure is witnessed in suffering. God is proud of you because he's bringing suffering to, upon your, your life. And he knows nothing will happen to you. In the case of, uh, if you read, uh, I, love, I, I always love this story. If you read uh, Desire Pages, the chapter Lazarus of Bethany, uh, it's, it is said that Christ and Lazarus were so tight. They were so, they were good buddies to the extent that Christ said, you know what, for this guy, I want to do something special for him. I'm going to do my greatest miracle using this guy. And so that's why Lazarus died four days. And Christ said, no, relax, guys. I'm going there. <laughs> and you know, in fact, when they came to tell him, he says, Lazarus, and, and by the way, the, the distance between uh, uh, Bethany and, and where Jesus was, was about a two days journey. So Jesus heard the, the news that Lazarus is sick and is about to die. And he waited two days. <laughs> In those two days, Lazarus died. And then two days later, Jesus says, let's now go to, to Bethany. And he knew it was going to take another two days to walk. But he knew. And then when he gets, you know what I, I like, I, I always feel excited when I read the story and I talk about it. Because when he gets to the, to the, to the house, they say, ah, in fact, it's, it's Martha. Martha was a, was a theologian. If you read about Martha, Mary is the one who didn't, who didn't uh, um, Mary, sorry, was the theologian. Martha was the one who was not bothered about it church things. <laughs> so Mary comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, you know, you are good and great, but if you were here, if you had been here before you died, I'm sure you, you wouldn't have died. Mm -hmm. You understand? And then Jesus says, no, 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 no. Uh, you will live again. Don't worry. And now Mary being the, the Adventist, you know, she starts teaching Jesus about the state of the dead. She says, yeah, Jesus, I, I know because when people die, there's a resurrection. <laughs> it's in the Bible. What, what, what? <laughs> and then Jesus says, no, resurrection. It's not a day. <laughs> resurrection is me. <laughs> I am the resurrection in the life. You understand? He starts to educate her that no, it's not an event or a day or a time. It's me. When I appear, resurrection is, is come. You understand? So th th that's what he was trying to teach uh, 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 Mary. And, and he says, I'm going to, 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 to raise him. And then, you know, the prayer Jesus makes before the people, I like Jesus, you know. He says, Father, <laughs> I know you hear me, <laughs> but this time I'm, 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 I'm praying loudly <laughs> so that they know that what's happening right now is because of my connection to, to you. I could have done this secretly, but I don't want to do it secretly. Father, because I want them to know that what's happening right now is because of our, our, our link. It says, so, as soon after praying the prayer, it says, Lazarus, come home. And Lazarus comes from the grave. So people are marveled, you know, and, and people understand now that, so Christ is not essentially using his own power on earth, but he's using divine power from, and he's showing us an example that if you walk in God's ways, you can do that. You can go to a, 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 a COVID-stricken ward and stand there and say to everyone who's in that ward, 
please pick your pajamas and walk out here. And people yeah. walk out from their ventilators. But only when you walk in the ways of, of God. The last, uh, the last two benefits is walking, when, you are, when you fear the Lord, God accepts you. You are accepted by God. And the last one is when you pray, God hears the prayers of those who, who fear him. So that's why sometimes we pray for sick people and they remain what? <laughs> sick. It's because God is not going to pay attention to a, to a prayer of a person that does not what? Fear him. Okay. He first loved us. Like I said earlier, I'm not going to dwell much on this because time is moving. God requires of us what he has demonstrated. God first loved you. If you are here and can raise your hand and say, I loved God first, please raise, raise your hand. <laughs> I challenge you. <laughs> the answer is there's no one. Even before you were born, God loved you. Did you know that? And before you were born, the Bible talks about predestination. And sometimes people think that predestination has to do with us being lost or saved. No, no, no. Predestination has to do with God pre-approving or pre-reserving love for who? For you and me. Did you know that in, in the book of Lamentations, chapter 3, the Bible says, it is the Lord's mercy that we are not what? Consumed. They are new how much? Every morning. Did you know that every morning, God purposely pre produces a fresh batch of mercy for you and me? Every morning. Every morning that you rise, you rise God, is, God has. And did you know that God keeps stock of his power? <laughs> if you didn't know that, you should listen to Jesus when he was walking in the crowd in, in Mark chapter 12. And a woman touched him. It was not the plan. The plan was not to help a woman who is with, who's sick of blood. They were walking towards another mission. But someone just inter interfered and touched Jesus. And power went from him. And he said, someone touched me. And these people are saying, ah, Jesus, come on. There are many people here. And he says, no, no, no. I, 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 can, I can feel power. And my, I know my power. <laughs> my power left me. Someone touched me. So God knows, if you, don't, if you also don't agree, you should read the, the parable of uh, the, the fig tree, where Christ says, in fact, it's the father who says, huh? how much more can I do to this tree? I've given it all that it requires. And then Jesus comes and says, Father, no, no, no. Let's give it one more year. God keeps stock of the things he has put in your life. And he does those things purposely. That's the predestination of love. In other words, God says, actually, there's a book written by this author who says, you cannot outgive God. God. God actually dares you to say, if you give, for example, something to church or whatever, to charity, God will never owe you. <laughs> he will never owe you. He will give you more than you gave. That's God. If you continue giving, you always make sure he's not in debt with you. You understand? So God first loved us. He, he, he didn't wait for us to love him. And what God does, everything that God does for us, he is motivated by himself. <laughs> Nothing in us motivates God to do anything for us. Did you know that? Everything God does for us, he, he sits down and says, I want to do it. Because he's love. And love is useless if there are no objects to show it on, if there's no one to demonstrate it on. It's useless. So some people have asked me this question and say, why did God make us? If he knew that we were going to suffer, if he knew Lucifer was going to sin, blah, blah, blah. it's because of love. Love persuaded him to say, even though there's the risk of Lucifer, I will still love them. And God is so, so, he, he, is so, he, he has so much faith in his own love. He says, my love will produce saints. And saints that can live in heaven without sin. 
That's the argument God has. And Lucifer says, no, it's impossible, God. Your love cannot do that. You have to scare people a little bit, or you have to do this a little bit to people so that they love you, no, no, so that they believe in you. No, 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 no. God says, no, I don't have to scare them. I don't even have to bribe them. I just simply have to love them. And the people who recognize love will follow love. I'll give you a hand, my teacher. Uh, I'm, I'm just rushing to conclude so that we can keep, we can keep up with time. And then he says, if you love me, do what? This is a common statement, right? This is our part now. This is our part. The biggest argument, the biggest sign, the biggest way to demonstrate our love for God is obedience. Obedience is your biggest, it's your loudest uh, statement to people. You, you can't tell people you love God when, when <laughs> you know, by giving or by, by wearing church regalia or by coming to church. No, no, no. That's not your greatest argument. Your biggest argument, as far as loving God is concerned, is obedience. And obedience is not spoken for. Obedience is evident. I, I don't know if you heard that point. Yeah. You don't have to tell people that you obey God. <laughs> it's evident. So if you don't, it's also evident. Um, yeah, so I don't, I don't think I need to draw much on this, on this point. I, and then the first commandment is my, my, last, my last part. And then maybe we can have discussions and contributions. Uh, the first commandment, and on this day, we are looking now at the link between the Old and the New Testament. Remember, Christ also quoted this piece of scripture. You remember the memory text that we read in, 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 in Deuteronomy chapter, chapter 6. Christ also, uh, so I'm going to ask someone to put their finger on Mark chapter 12, verse, verse 28. As, we, as, as I conclude, I'm going to ask you to read for me. So the connection between the Old and New Testament, and it, it, is, it, is, it is said that there's at least 295 quotes in the New Testament that are borrowed from the Old Testament. At least. And there's over thousands of allusions. You know that thing where we do, where we say, where we say Type, anti-type, type, anti-type. You remember that? Remember that? Okay, I didn't see enough notes to, to say. Okay, type, anti-type, what is that, right? Type is an example, right? It's a miniature figure. It's, it's, like an ex it's a demonstration. It's not the actual, it's a simulation, okay? Understand, right? The anti-type is the actual example. The killing of uh, lambs in the Old Testament was a simulation because the blood of lambs does not save. It cannot save, but it was a simulation, right? The actual, the antitype is who? The death of Christ, because the blood of Christ can save. You get it? But these, anti these types are good for us because they, they point us towards where? They point us towards Christ. So to put the, the, this whole Old Testament versus New Testament thing to rest, the God of the New Testament is the same as the God of the, God of the Old Testament. There's no difference. The standard of salvation and the, men, the means of salvation in the Old and the New Testament is the same. All together. The God that saves the Old Testament people is the one that saves the New Testament people. So there's over thousands of allusions in the New Testament to Old Testament. Now, let's go to, um, okay, Matthew has the most uh, citations from the Old Testament, and then followed by Luke. And then the book of Romans is believed to have over 35% of its verses referring to the Old Testament. That's about 153 verses from 433 verses. And then Hebrews is about 69% of its, of its content talking about the Old Testament. And that's about 210 verses from 433 verses. In the book of Revelation now, there's over 100% 
over 100% of what Revelation talks about is in the Old Testament. That's about 605 verses from, from 605 citations, sorry, from 404 verses. So 605 times the Bible, the Re Revelation talks about the Old Testament in 404 verses. So can you see that there's no disconnect between the old and the, and the new? Now, when Jesus says, and who has verse 28, by the way? I asked for verse 28, Mark 12. Who has verse 28? Please read. 28. Yes. Mark 12, right? Yes. Noticing that Jesus had given them the answer. Yes. He asked of him of all the commandments, yes. which is the most important. Right. Stop there. Do you know why he asked this question? The reason why he asked this question is because the rabbis uh, had about 613 commandments. How many do we have? That we, that we know publicly there are 10, but there are more, of course. So the rabbis now had 613. <laughs> so the reason why he's asking Christ this question, he wants to trap him to say, okay, Christ, which one of the 613 is more important? <laughs> you, know, you understand? And Christ, because the 613, you obvious, if Christ thought like a man, like me, like you'd be like, hey, sh <laughs> yeah, that's a tough one. You understand? But Christ didn't subscribe. He didn't, bow, he didn't even bow down to, to their reasoning. You understand? What does Jesus say? Continue. Verse uh, 29. The most important one, Jesus answered, mm -hmm. is this. Mm. Hear, O Israel, yes. the Lord our God. The Lord is one. Yes. Love the Lord your God with all your heart mm -hmm. and with all your soul mm -hmm. and with all your mind mm -hmm. and with all your strength. Yes. That's step one. Ah, it's okay. That's fine. So do you see now Jesus directly quoting Deuteronomy chapter? Chapter six. In other words, what, what, what Christ is, is trying to say is that this prayer of the Shema, which is the monotheistic prayer, nothing has changed. Our God is the same yesterday, today, and, and forever. So Christ is saying, I also subscribe to that what? To that belief. And this is very important about Jesus. It's very important. If you read Christ, especially when Christ is talking, he says, have you not read about me in the prophets? Have you not heard what, it's, what it says? They, they, they. You understand? Christ will always refer you to, to the Old Testament. Because the law of first mention is very what? Is very important. Getting the, the, the story where it is first mentioned is very important. Do you understand? Can you see how significant to the New Testament understanding the Old Testament is? Ah, come on, people. Are you getting me? I, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm losing you. Am I losing you? Can you see how pivotal, for example, it is for us to gain understanding? Because there are people who, who come and say, you people are, are quoting the Old Testament. You are, you are, you are backward or old-fashioned or I don't know. Because there are so many things that we teach as Adventists, for example, that have their origins in the Old Testament. That inform the New Testament. The issue of the state of the dead, what, 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 diet, all these things. You understand? They inform our worship, even in the New Testament. And so people will struggle and say, what's the link? Here's the link. You understand? So now coming to loving God, even as, as we are, and Christ even goes further and says with all your might. Christ added that bit. Did you notice that? It's not in Deuteronomy. It says with all your might. He's simply saying, guys, and I think this is my final submission. My final submission to you guys is God is not, 
I hope this doesn't sound cocky. <laughs> but God is really not desperate for, for, for people to worship him, you know? <laughs> He's not. He's not desperate. So when you, when you decide to do this thing with God, God is looking for all or nothing. God is an all or nothing kind of God. When you say you are doing God's things, you give how much? Everything. If you think you can't give everything, like in the case of, 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 of uh, Ananias and Sapphira, <laughs> what, what happens to you? <laughs> Peter, Peter actually said to them, guys, are you, sure, are you sure this is what you said you want to give God? They said, yeah, yeah, it's it, that's it. Uh, it that's <laughs> and by the way, did you know that it was a lot? Even though it was not, it was not exactly what they had promised. That, that same thing that they gave, it was a lot. <laughs> but it was just not what they had said. It was not all, in other words. Because they had said, I will give you all, all. And now they say, uh, it's, we want to give this, this, this. And then this is what happens to them. Yes, my leader. Um, thanks. I think one thing I, I, I liked in the lesson just to um, wrap up what I learned what it means to love God. And, and, and someone mentioned the concept of love languages. I'm sure we've heard about that, but within the uh, you know, realm of earthly relationships, mm -hmm. that there are primarily five love languages, and uh, depending on where you come from and how you were raised and all of that, you are predisposed to a particular love language. So if you and your spouse have different love languages and you seek to love them in your own language and not in their language, they will feel unloved. Some of us learned that the hard way by the way. When you know how you want to be loved, and you transfer that to the other person. Meanwhile, they've got their own Lovely. love language, which is different from yours. And you wonder why you keep having a conflict. Meanwhile, in your mind, you're thinking, but I am showing love. No, the other person feels unloved because we are not loving them in their love language. Mm. So someone said, obedience is God's love language. That is his specific way of saying, this is how I am made to feel loved by my objects. If we keep these commandments. Mm. I, I think it, 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 it was something that is a very simple analogy, but uh, it, it kind of, you know, it was a light bulb moment for me because I understand very well the, the concept of, of love, love languages. languages. Yeah. And, and the importance of love languages. You can love a person so hard, <laughs> but if it is not their love language, they will feel unloved. Similarly, uh, with God, we can do whatever it is that we think God wants of us. Uh, 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 you know, sometimes we do all sorts of things claiming to love God. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, all he wants obey my commandments. That's it. That is the only way. That is his love language. Thank you. Hmm. Obedience is better than sacrifice. My That's true. Yes. The first, the first commandment. How can you love God in obedience? What will you say? <coughs> Indeed. Indeed. Uh, I, I, I will try to just uh, answer you, but with, 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 with close, closing up because we have to really close up. Yes, it's important for us to 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 realize that in the aspect of loving god it's not just about loving god um like in the case like uh, what you are saying elder our obedience to god is not uh because god doesn't say oh i've received your love i felt it ha largely what happens is that the beneficiaries of that obedience are us Okay, I'll give you an example, and I want to. I hope this example is just the last one. You remember in the book of Genesis, chapter eighteen, when the when the angels came to 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 to, to destroy Sodom. You remember, and then Abraham kept asking and saying, "Will you destroy it if there's eighteen? If there's ten people or fifty people, for example? I ah, first said hundred. If there's hundred people that obey, 
He said, no, no, no. If there's 100 people, we'll spare it. What about if there's, uh, if there's 50, we'll spare it. What about if there's 10, we'll spare it. You understand? What about if there's one? And they said, well, what? We'll spare it. You understand? In other words, what, what, what the angels were simply so showing us or telling us is that sometimes, sometimes we are beneficiaries of one person's obedience. One. Yeah. An entire city can become successful just because they, in that city, there's one person that fears God. One. Imagine if there were two. Imagine if there were five. Imagine if there were 10. Understand? A disease can pass, a, a, it can rampage other cities and destroy other people and, and miss you. Not because you are right, not because you are good, but because in your proximity, there is a man that fears God. That's why the Bible says, as it was by one man's disobedience, all of us were led into what? Into sin, you understand? All of us, we, we, we are born with the sinful nature because of Adam, you understand? So by one man's obedience, are, more, are all brought back to what? To light. In other words, by Christ's obedience, Christ alone, Christ, it was Christ's obedience. One man, his obedience is enough to buy us all of our salvation. That's the impact of, 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 of a God you have not seen now. What am I saying? I am saying, time is gone. I'm saying, when we love God, we don't give it to him directly. We demonstrate it via who? The people we see, that's what I'm saying. You, you can't say you love God, but the people you, who are next to you are suffering. That's not what loving God is. Loving God is demonstrating it practically through the people you, you what? You see? Now, let us pray. We have, we have gone over time, you. I'm sorry, my lady. Let us pray. Our kind and heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this morning once again. We thank you for the insights and uh, the, 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 stat the lessons we have, we've learned this morning. More so about loving you and how it relates and pertains to our life and salvation. We have learned, Lord, that without love, um, we, we, we cannot be sufficiently motivated to do anything. Anything else, Father, that persuades us to do anything for you, which is outside of love, may it not, may it not be found in us, Lord. May you plant the seed of love that germinates and grows into a, a, a tree that blossoms with obedience, with respect, with, with reverence, with fear. All these things that are qualities that have been brought about by your love for us. Help us to continue to have the mind of Christ within us. That mind that persuades us and moves us and teaches us to walk in your ways. We thank you for this Sabbath morning. And now as we continue, please continue with us. Lead us in your, uh, in, with your, through your spirit. And continue to be with those that are, are, are attending virtually. Bless them as they, as they, as wherever they are. And I ask that you uh, be with them indeed. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen.